today on the Perception in Action podcast, my interview with John Vanderkamp from the Vrie University in Amsterdam. What does the latest research say about the benefits of implicit learning? What are the roles of the dorsal and ventral streams in the control of action and the perception of affordances? How can constraints manipulations and adding variability to practice help athletes find creative movement solutions? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with John Vanderkamp. John has done a lot of really interesting work in the areas of perception, action, and human movement science. In the interview, we discuss topics including implicit learning, how effective is it, how does it fit with the ecological approach, how might it depend on the individual learner, the two streams hypothesis in vision, how might the ventral and dorsal streams be involved in sports performance, what kind of information do they use, and creativity. What is it really? How might we explain it and encourage its development from an ecological point of view? So today my guest is John Vanderkamp from the Vrie University in Amsterdam. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, John. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Fine. Nice to do that. Okay. So can you, to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, well, I have a, a pretty regular educational background, I would say. So I started primary school, secondary school, and then uh, went to university and started studying human movement science. And in, um, in, in the Netherlands, we have a, a clear distinction between vocational um, education and university education. Mm-hmm. So many people working in sports science have a, a PE background or something like that, or have experience in terms of uh, teaching children or athletes. I don't have that, so I, I actually do not know much about movement, I would say. Uh, I, I do know a little bit about theories of movement. Uh, but I'm not a teacher. Uh, I've, I know everything from reading and from, uh, from experiments. And, and so I started doing human movement science. And uh, one of the first teachers or professors that I had was uh, Professor Whiting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll probably talk with more people and uh, there will be more people. Uh, I've mentioned him as one of uh, as big inspiration. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky that at the end of the, his career, uh, he was still in Amsterdam and uh, had some teaching uh, from him. And that introduced me to motor control and motor co- coordination. And, and you, um, you're kind of, you do a lot of your work, you do is kind of aligns with the ecological psychology kind of approach. Um, did you have a particular moment kind of when you aligned with that view or kind of all along you kind of moved towards it? Well, I, I, I'm I'm not completely sure what the first moment was that I got in contact with that, but mm-hmm. it, it, it definitely was John Whiting. Mm-hmm. Um, so in in as first years, he he taught us the the motor control and learning book from from McGill, and this was well basic motor control and learning, of course. And uh, his idea was to actually introduce the the students first into these basic building blocks. And then uh, in the next year, make it somewhat more exciting and uh, going more to the edge of science of what was going on. And so th- this is late 80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think in that time, as far as I could see as a student and looking back, it was actually quite exciting because ecological psychology, but also dynamic systems uh, were making, uh, uh, were getting an, an, quite an impact, certainly in Amsterdam where uh, John Whiting had uh, several PhD students, mm-hmm. uh, Geert Savelsberg, who mm-hmm. became my uh, supervisor, mm-hmm. Reinhard Bootsma, Peter Beek, Beatrix Verijken. Mm-hmm. And he, he actually gave them lots of freedom. And you, you can actually see that uh, lots of these uh, students published work without uh, uh, John Whiting's name on it. And so they, they, were, they actually were encouraged to do their own thing. And all of them were actually uh, interested in ecological psychology. And so that's, I think that's more or less, so I do remember that we had lab visits at PhD students, and that's the first time I met these people. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's probably the first introduction uh, in terms of also ecological psychology. I think it's a, it was a um, in the Netherlands, we, uh, um, in, in terms of movement science, there is a, uh, 
some kind of history that connects us also to um, phenomenology mm-hmm. and existential phenomenology and uh, and our clear uh, the clear links of course uh, between ecological psychology and existential phenomenology so there was a a good ground also for the students then to understand why ecological psychology was interesting also from a more uh, meta theoretical point of view or philo- philosophical point of view mm-hmm. and um, i think what uh, some of the these uh, the spirit of that time you can find in in the book um, the motor action controversy it's edited by ono meyers who was also a teacher there mm-hmm. in that time and uh, and klaus roth i think and Having different chapters of different people, I think Dick Smith is in there, Kelso, uh, uh, discussing about very fundamental approaches to uh, to human movement science, and and if if we, I think the discussion then were actually much more fundamental than we uh, than we have nowadays, mm-hmm. to some degree, at least in my experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I, f- I find it it's funny. Well, these arguments keep coming up, and I think people f- forget this. This is debate's been going for a long time, so yeah, yeah, some yeah, of yeah. those old um, books, I think, yeah, are hugely valuable to look at how people. Yeah, yeah. Can, well, yeah. what you see in ecological psychology yeah. is that I think that that it's in some sense it gets a second life because we now also uh, have this embodied cognition ideas. Mm-hmm. Many people then also go back to ecological psychology uh, and arguing that this is one of the forerunners of embodied cognition. And I think this has broadened the interest in ecological psychology, also among people that are actually not really into ecological psychology itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so the influence of this approach is, uh, I think, slowly increasing without really being in controversy anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's slowly, in some sense, and and some part of the main, mainstream becoming a little bit more mainstream, I guess. Yeah. No, I'd agree. Yeah, <laughs> you don't too much of a mainstream because then it's not. Then it's getting less interesting. Like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> so to get into kind of some of the specifics of what you've done, you've done a lot of different things, but one one of the way I wanted to start with was kind of the work you've done on impl- implicit learning. Does that mm-hmm. would that did that start when you were in in Hong Kong with working with you work with Rich Masters for a while, yeah, right yeah, in Hong yeah. Kong? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well, it, it took off more than uh, it became more important, of course, when mm-hmm. I when I was in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it's also something to to do with ecological psychology. We were looking for ways of learning without having a big lo- load or dependence on all kinds of cognitive uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's why I got interested in, in implicit learning. And I was also doing at that time, so now we're talking about late 90s, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, doing all kinds of developmental work where mm-hmm. things like verbal instruct- uh, instructions are, uh, we, we, you're not going to verbally instruct your infants how to reach or how to walk because that's not going to work out and you don't have to study that. <laughs> so that, that suggests that in terms of learning and, and change, in, uh, in in motor behavior, there's more than verbal instructions. And as as things goes, um, uh, one of my study friends was uh, Renko Polman, and uh, he did his masters in uh, in in York when uh, John Whiting had moved to uh, to York, mm-hmm. and he actually lived uh, with a guy called Rich Masters. So I visited. <laughs> Uh, Remco, I had no idea who Rich Masters was, <laughs> mm-hmm. and started briefly met him, and then a couple of day, a uh, couple of years later, I met him again on the conference, and then we started talking, and, mm-hmm. and well, clearly there was a click into on a, on a personal level, mm-hmm. uh, but also on a professional level, and uh, so that that got me interested in implicit learning. Uh, because I thought it, it really nicely fitted with ecological psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fifteen years later, I think that was a that was an incorrect uh, thought, perhaps. <laughs> but that's how science works. So yeah. Sometimes uh, you you make a decision, think, well, this is where I go for, and I'm becoming more and more convinced uh, we should consider implicit learning as really as a as an opposite of explicit learning theories as well with the same uh, same theoretical background mm-hmm. and, uh, and so the discussion uh, in implicit learning is uh, and it's a bit of a straw man as well i guess but it's for instance with the model of fitz and postman mm-hmm. uh, where they are talking about 
the role of verbal instructions to uh, to under- first learning to understand uh, how you need to move, mm. and then uh, slowly incorporate that in, into some kind of uh, motor programs and being able to do this automatically based on on verbal instructions, accumulating knowledge. And then uh, in some way store this in motor programs that can do the job for you then without thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's the discussion or the framework in which implicit learning or most of the implicit learning work is done. Mm -hmm. And so in that respect, I think that's why I'm saying, well, I'm I'm not sure whether it it really fits to ecological psychology. Mm -hmm. And and the, the challenge for ecological psychology now is perhaps to come with a better framework to actually integrate also the important role of verbal and, and explicit instructions. Mm-hmm. Because we as, as humans, we can we can learn f- very proficiently, I would say, and so, sometimes very quickly with explicit instructions. So if, uh, with, uh, I find the, the, the corona crisis was a, a very good example <laughs> that people were told not to shake hands anymore, but do something uh, <laughs> like this. And uh, uh, you can tell people this and then also Mm -hmm. give an example, of course. Mm -hmm. And then in one or two trials, they can do this pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had to learn this implicitly, then that would would have a more disastrous effect uh, from corona than we had already uh, in in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. And so it's clearly that there is a role uh, that we cannot deny for uh, for experts and instructions, and I think one of the challenges for ecological psychology is is to come to terms uh, with that and to integrate that in their model. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you completely, John. I think there's a lot of parallels between implicit learning and ecological approach, but yeah, I think yeah. both implicit implicit learning is really couched in information processing. Why it why it works? Yeah. Like the, the explanation Rich would give would be very couched in, yeah, 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 yeah. but it, you're right, not accumulating knowledge. So you did, I think you did a recent review of kind of what, what you found in terms of how effective implicit learning is. Do you, what, what's kind of that, you, where you stand on kind of some of the methods like errorless learning and those kind of things on, on their yeah, effectiveness? Yeah, so so I, I think that's, you can clearly see as, you see that often when new paradigms mm-hmm. uh, emerge that you have some kind of first round where you first want to show that that it works, and I think uh, uh, and that implicit learning can have an effect, that you can learn implicitly, and perhaps that it has some advantages in terms of uh, faster automatization mm-hmm. or uh, robustness against stress or pressure. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, uh, Rich Masters has done, has done a great job there in, in, in showing that that is possible. And then you get the second round, and again, I think Rich was very uh, influential there in terms of broadening the scope by developing all kinds of uh, methods to to do implicit interventions in motor learning mm-hmm. and apply it to all kinds of different uh, tasks and groups so not only sports but in rehabilitation in mm-hmm. uh, in pe in surgery etc and, and i think we what we know in is that people start to look more critically uh, in uh, into the evidence and and also in terms of what kind of factors actually allow people to profit more or less from uh, implicit or explicit learning? I think mm-hmm. that's where we are now. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, one of the, uh, I have one student, a very very good student, actually, he's now in uh, in London at Brunel, uh, Al Macau, and he did his PhD looking into internal external focus of attention. And well, there's of course a debate whether this is really implicit or explicit learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it clearly has associations, and in his work for his PC, also an analysis looking into into the studies that uh, uh, really compared the degree of automatization after implicit learning and mm-hmm. compared it with, with explicit learning, uh, because that's one of the claims that is made that with implicit learning, more quickly or perhaps even immediately automatized, mm-hmm. so you don't you don't need to think about how um, how you move. And so the standard way to test this in, uh, from a more uh, psychological approach is using dual tasks mm-hmm. and then see to what degree this dual task uh, after learning uh, disrupts the motor performance. Mm-hmm. And then you can calculate dual task costs, etc. And so in doing this review, the first thing that we noticed actually that uh, we as researchers have to make sure that we uh, certainly in terms of reporting make much more clear 
uh, what we do in our research and how we did our research so that we are more strict in mm -hmm. our research methods. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots to gain for. And I think that's for human movement science in general mm -hmm. uh, to become more rigorous in our experimentation. And the second thing what we what we found was that, uh, so we found, uh, I think, about 40 experiments where there was a direct comparison. Mm -hmm. And uh, in most of these comparisons, there was, a, was actually not a, a significant difference in terms of uh, the adverse effect of the dual task on motor performance. Mm -hmm. In, uh, I think, about 20, 20 or 25% there was an advantage for uh, for after implicit learning, and there were also two or three studies that showed an advantage for explicit learning. Okay. And so I would say that the evidence is 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 weak, and but what it also shows is that these studies are really uh, really brief. So we do motor learning studies, and then have practice sessions, just. Uh, one or two sessions, and then uh, if we're lucky, then uh, and that's one of the critiques that we that, that you see that lots of these students do not have proper retention tests or whatever. And as a retention test or post test, uh, but the learning uh, is really short, and and so I think that in itself is actually much more more Im important in terms of what we are studying. That if we are really interested in motor learning, then we need to do more effort in creating studies that allow people really to learn mm -hmm. and, and and really go through the motions of motor learning as well. And so by focusing on explicit implicit learning, almost the prime char characteristics of expertise is of learning is becoming or being automatized. And I think expertise is much more than only being automatized. Mm -hmm. And also learning is much more than working towards automatization. Yeah. There's so much going on in learning. And if you do these short studies, then uh, so I think one of the most important things is that if we learn, then we need to in some way become engaged in the learning process. Mm -hmm. And so it must, must have value for us to actually, uh, to actually be able to keep on going and keep on practicing to get better. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the kind of studies that we're doing, then we keep undergraduate students in mm -hmm. and we pay them a small fee on some, or, or some credits and we do relatively boring experiments, I would say. <laughs> yes, and yes. Luckily, luckily, for, luckily for them, it's only one hour, uh -huh. uh, but it's still boring and they're not really motivated. They're mm -hmm. not there to actually improve the performance. Mm -hmm. and, and I think these are, uh, I would say, these emotions of learning uh, these are really important in learning in in the real life, so in sports and in in rehab and in uh, perhaps in uh, physical education uh, classes, mm -hmm. and and so that's mo much more than uh, than automatization, I would say. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, added to that, I would say that uh, currently the the strength of the evidence for this automatization, uh, comparing implicit and explicit uh, learning, is weak. And also, perhaps the, at least from ecological point of view, uh, also the theoretical issues. Mm -hmm. I think uh, so. so um, uh, I'm slowly moving, uh, very slowly. So I still do lots of implicit explicit mm -hmm. learning, and I think it's still important and interesting. Mm -hmm. But I, I've, I also feel that I'm slowing moving uh, or trying to integrate other stuff in there as well. Yeah. Uh, so what, what we're also doing is looking into the factors that actually differentiates explicit and implicit learning or the effectiveness of these okay. uh, mm -hmm. interventions. Uh, also did this in this review. We're then looking at uh, comparing actually groups of participants. And of course, there are in individual differences between the members of these groups. Mm -hmm. It might be the case that some of the some of the participants, or some of the kids, or some of the athletes, or some of the patients, will profit more from explicit interventions, as others will profit more from implicit interventions. And I think that's now, uh, uh, and also Rich is doing this work, and Tim Bussett in uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's now slowly growing evidence, and not everything is published yet. That, for instance, this verbal working memory capacity mm -hmm. uh, is an important predictor of how well people can actually profit from uh, from explicit learning and uh, also the reverse if 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 you have uh, children or patients uh, that have poor working uh, verbal working memory cap capacity 
then explicit learning might actually be a disadvantage. And and this this working memory capacity allows you to actually, uh, if you get an instruction, and often an instruction never comes in once, but you mm-hmm. often get a series of instructions, so you have chunks of information that uh, mm-hmm. that you need to remember. And then typically you have also have to uh, manipulate or adjust it in such a way that you can actually use it. Yes. And mm-hmm. and and so. Uh, you 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 have to remember uh, information and manipulate that information to be able to use these instructions. And so, if if you have low working memory uh, capacity, then this might be particularly uh, particularly uh, difficult. And um, and we see this in some children, um, uh, cerebral palsy or DCD. Mm-hmm. There's a higher percentage of children that also have. Uh, a weaker working memory. Mm-hmm. So for these children, uh, implicit learning can certainly, or less explicit instructions can certainly be be helpful and more beneficial. Another issue that comes up more and more often is um, kinesthetic perception. So uh, mm-hmm. the ability to actually perceive where your where your arms and feet are. So if uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you ever did a handstand, but if, <laughs> if you try to do this and then. Uh, we have to, uh, at home. We have this little chair that it's e- uh, somewhat easier, and then they always shout at me. You should stand straight, and I, I'm standing straight. <laughs> I have no idea what the angle of my knees is. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and so we know, we know, uh, for instance, in stroke patients, that patients who have have poorer kinesthetic perception, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they actually profit more from uh, from explicit uh, or internal focus instructions. Okay. So there again. Uh, so that I, I think we, we're slowly getting more knowledge about how we can actually differentiate these uh, different interventions so that we can, to some degree, optimize the interventions for certain groups of people. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important, uh, important step. So I think in that respect, thinking about these distinctions is really important, uh, but we should not contrast them, but they, they to some degree, actually complement each other depending on individual constraints or task constraints uh, and, mm. and learning stuff. Yeah, I think there's a couple of really, the, the interpretation of cues or instructions is a really overlooked, like a lot of, the, you're, like you said, there's a, can be a big load, there can be, you have to kind of change the frame of reference, like if I tell you yeah, move, yeah. move left, what does that move mean to you? <laughs> I, I'm not uh, completely sure, but I think it's actually a, a drawback that many of the researchers do not regularly teach other people how to move. At least for me, it is. Mm-hmm. So if I have to set up an experiment, then actually I cannot think of good instructions that would be sensible for uh, someone to learn. Mm-hmm. And so what we often do is just we, we take a textbook mm-hmm. or, uh, or we take a, a, a coaching book or whatever and then take out a few of these instructions or even... Uh, take uh, papers from our colleagues, the goal of putting, mm-hmm. so what instruction did they use? And then we go to our participants uh, and they get these instructions, but, uh, but we do not really know whether they are useful given what they already can and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that's one, one other reason that it's so important to actually also go out into the wild and uh, go into, for instance, rehabilitation sessions where you have uh, therapists that do this, I don't know, 20 hours a week. They mm-hmm. do one-on-one sessions with patients and they have built an, an intuitive base on uh, what can work on or, or cannot work or they they have some rule of thumbs to, to do try out and then home into what what works for them. And uh, I think as scientists, and, that, and uh, surely this happens also in... In sports, etc. As mm. scientists, we should much more actually sh- just observe what is happening and and see uh, and try to find regularities there. And based on that, then do our experiments and trying to f- uh, find out what works and does not work. Because then, th- then we have a much better chance that if things don't work, that's not because we actually provide them with the wrong instructions or mm-hmm. uh, meaningless instructions. Yeah, and uh, and and. and and I think that's also an important thing in, in motor learning. One of the uh, steps that we really have to look into is uh, what is actually adequate information and also for verbal instructions, what are uh, adequate verbal instructions 
depending on uh, the phase of learning where someone is mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. And so you can have instructions that, that are more explaining what you do and perhaps some of the, the movements that you make. And early on, that can be, that can be helpful. And, and humans are particularly smart in using these uh, instructions, I guess. Mm-hmm. But perhaps at the later stage, if uh, then uh, you want to provide instructions that actually increase the variability of uh, in practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so then it's not so much focused anymore on how to perform the movement, but actually present uh, learners with new challenges or and challenge them to try it, to do it in different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, and we, can, uh, we kind of and we do a lot in terms of adjustments in the environment, mm-hmm. but also uh, verbal instructions can be really helpful and have the, and have those functions. Yeah. And I think it's important just uh, really looking into the content of of the instructions is still relatively poorly studied. I think, mm-hmm. uh, or at least as far as I know. And I think that's one of the things that, that we can actually uh, gain a lot still. Yeah, I totally agree, John. Uh, one of the points I've made too is, you know, for experimental control, we want to give everybody in the one twenty people in the one group the same exact instructions. Uh, there's no coach in the world that would give twenty different athletes the exact same <laughs> cues, right? They they individualize, yeah. So um, it's kind of un- unfair in a way, but. Another, so another big one, uh, kind of a dichotomy, I guess, you, you, that you've worked on is that a lot of people I think are interested in the, is the dorsal versus ventral stream in, in vision. Uh, yeah. And one of the things I really like this because you've used it to, to kind of not only kind of challenge some of the research that's been done, some of the paradigms that have been used, but also I, the, the gut reaction would be, I think most people would assume that all sports is going to be all dorsal, <laughs> right? Right, because that's the action stream. But no, yeah, you yeah, yeah. you have a, yeah. come up with some interesting for that both. You know, my boss. So, kind of, how did you get into that? And you know, you know, what are your thoughts on on that? Yeah. So, so uh, as you know, of course, I did my PhD in ball catching, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so my supervisor there was uh, uh, next to Geert Salzberg was uh, Claire Michaels. Mm-hmm. And this was uh, about time to contact, and I wanted to show that people can actually use uh, different types of information controlling uh, the catching movements and especially the timing of the catch. And in doing that, one of the things that I used was um, um, the, the telestereoscope, which is equipment and so kind of glasses of four mirrors that actually effectively increases the distance between your eyes and then it manipulates uh, binocular information. Mm-hmm. This is a thing that I think is uh, uh, invented. A helmet? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it allows you to see that at, uh, at larger distances. And so when we when we did this, uh, we used this for our catching stuff, then what we clearly saw was, uh, so you increase the inter, uh, interocular, so the distance between the eyes, so everything looks closer or should look closer. And so people were closing their hand earlier. So that worked uh, Mm -hmm. really nice. But if you ask people what they they saw, then many of the participants were actually saying, well, I see the ball farther away. And uh, while they were were closing their hands earlier. Okay. And this is, of course, some kind of discrepancy in the sense of, well, they say they see it farther away, Mm -hmm. but they act as if they see it closer. And then I think it was Geert. Uh, who, who, who told me to uh, that he had read something about this Goodell and Milner ventral dorsal stuff, <laughs> and so I started reading into that. And so in my uh, first epilogue of my thesis, I uh, it was all Goodell and Milner, and then Clem Michael told me, "Well, this is not a good move for your career, so you better get rid of this." <laughs> and, and, I was. I, I, I'm not sure if I was agreeing at that point of time, but uh, I think r- slowly. Again, just like in prison learning, well, mm-hmm. maybe uh, maybe I should have been a little bit less enthusiastic. But mm-hmm. that, that created the interest in uh, Udela Milner. And then we had a student from, from Spain, Fernando Rivas. Mm-hmm. And he was a badminton coach and he was really interested in anticipation and studying the work from, uh, from Bruce Abernetti, uh, mm-hmm. for instance, and Mark Williams. And so based on that, we, we actually got the idea that uh, if you look at this traditional work, then what uh, what researchers were actually asking participants to do were perceptual judgments. Mm-hmm. And so you were looking at the screen, and then you were saying, well, the shuttle is moving to the left, mm-hmm. to the right, or in front of me, or towards the back. Uh, but you were not actually moving. Mm-hmm. 
And based on this work of uh, Goodell and Milner, where they, where they argue that you have uh, a ventral stream that actually uh, is used to obtain knowledge of the world, to know about the world, tell mm-hmm. others about what you see, and a dorsal stream that is uh, uh, largely separate from, uh, from this uh, ventral stream that uses visual information to control your movement. So move your hand to intercept the ball. And so if a tennis ball is coming, then you can see it's a tennis ball. Perhaps uh, it's uh, a bit greenish, mm-hmm. as you can say, the color. Uh, but you also have to get the, your hands at the right moment, at the right time, in the part of the ball to actually intercept it. And so this... This knowing that it's a tennis ball and that it's green, that's a ventral function uh, based on the good deal and the stuff. Whereas the actual movement towards the ball and the interception would be controlled by, mm. uh, by the dorsal stream. And mm. then if you look into these experiments, then you only have perceptual judgments. So, mm. so we try to understand expertise in sport players and elite players and then we uh, indeed do not take uh, the dorsal stream into account, whereas mm-hmm. if it comes to action, then uh, the dorsal stream will be the number one stream that you develop, uh, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we st- that's where we started. And but of course, in terms of um, uh, if you act, you also have to perceive, and mm-hmm. it's probably also important to have some some knowledge about what's going on, that, because that will also influence what you do and the choices that you make. Mm-hmm. And so, in we considered uh, looking at anticipation that two things were important. The first thing was that you have to decide what you're going to do. So you have to uh, perceive the affordance of, of the situation. So are you going to make a forehand or a backhand? Are you, so that's the, the first thing that you need to do. And if you have decided on that, so you're, you you perceive the affordance, then, then you're in the right ballpark. And then the dorsal stream, as it were, controls the movement to actually realizing and uh, performing the forehand or the backhand. So the, the dorsal stream controls the action Mm-hmm. Whereas the ventral stream more or less tells the dorsal stream what to do. That, that's actually the, the idea in the 2008 paper. Mm-hmm. And it's very close and also inspired by the work of Bill Warren. Mm-hmm. I think it's a paper in this uh, motor action controversy book. Mm-hmm. Difficult word. <laughs> So yeah. there are always some of these words that are real stumbling blocks. Yes, for me. yes. <laughs> well, people and, say it different uh, ways too. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, pedagogy is another one. <laughs> if I have to teach and, I know, and uh, I'm teaching about nonlinear pedagogy, then what I do at breakfast is repeating, repeating, and <laughs> to me. NP, and, yeah. Uh, and I stand in front of, in the lecture hall for 100 students, uh, start saying, well, now I have to do it correctly, and then I choke <laughs> on the pressure. <laughs> but the, 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 the motor action, so joking on the pressure is a real thing, and reinforcement also is happy. <laughs> in some situations, it really uh, really is a phenomenon that works. And so, so Bill Warren was arguing that you, and so he proposed this law of controls, mm-hmm. uh, so that you first select an action mode and then link that to affordances. Mm -hmm. And then if you have selected an action mode, then you have an information movement coupling that you can actually uh, describe with a law of control Mm -hmm. and then uh, control the movement. And I think recently we have the work of uh, Brett Fagin, where he's actually arguing against this, uh, this distinction between action selection or affordance perception and then movement control, and is arguing for affordance-based control. Mm-hmm. And I actually think he makes a very good argument. And But if I accept that his argument, then I also have to accept that I was wrong in terms of the ventral and dorsal stream <laughs> contribution to participation, uh, because that's based on, on the Warren model and not on the on the Fagin uh, model. Yeah. Um, so again, I'm slowly moving away. <laughs> yeah, well. it's good to hear you. That's what I've been trying to <laughs> tell people. Yeah, we don't just immediately figure these things out. Yeah, I, the both <laughs> ideas. Um, I kind of like I like your the ventral dorsal one because one of the things that always not bugged me, but you know the the two pathways are getting the same information. Like for an, but for affordance, you're basing it kind of on the same information you're going to use to control. Right, you need to tell the direction and the time to contact to know that I'm going to yeah, charge yeah. and do a forehand. 
Yeah. And then you, the dorsal stream needs that information to actually control the movement. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's kind of the, makes sense with the, the ventral dorsal stream. Why would you have these two pathways sending the same information to two different places? But well, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. 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 So I, I think there is a difference in, in terms of the information that they use. So yes. the, the, the ventral stream is more allocentrically. So mm-hmm. it, it also takes more contextual information into account. It might be that the, the, the ventral stream is stronger in terms of understanding or detecting information in variants from, for instance, the record relative to the ball. Mm-hmm. And based on that, make predictions uh, about uh, uh, general predictions about where the ball will go to the left or to the right or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas if, if it comes to movement control, then you have to be linked to the, the motion of the ball and then rel- relative to where the ball is. And then you need information that um, tells you where you are relative to the ball. Mm-hmm. And then information from the player becomes less important. It's also what's in this paper, what gets quite some emphasis, uh, that these streams are actually specialized in detecting different kinds of information. And I, I emphasize that because uh, Goodell and Milner were much more in, in representational, mm-hmm. uh, computational approaches where they talk about uh, processing information. And so I wanted to really argue that perhaps these uh, were perceptual systems with different functions in, to some degree. Mm-hmm. I, now, I now think that there's still a difference in, in degree there, but what is much more important, I think, and that's why I still like uh, at least some of the work of this ventral and dorsal stuff, mm-hmm. that's that also the time scale in which they use information is clearly different. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's that's also critical in terms of our understanding of expertise. Uh, and I see that now as the critical actually failure of uh, the occlusion paradigm or all these video screen paradigms that by using a screen and not creating a real interaction, obviously there's not a real interaction, but one of the things that's, that's really different is that also the temporal constraints of the situation are completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you are a participant in these experiments, even if you mimic, let's say it's tennis, or even if you mimic, mimic the hit, then still it does not matter if you're five or ten milliseconds early or late. Mm-hmm. But, uh, on court, it's critical. What we want to understand in, uh, from these situations in anticipation is how people actually can deal with these time pressures. Mm-hmm. And so uh, for understanding of expertise, I think it's, it's really critical that we are moving away from these lab-based, video-based experiments because the most critical constraint that we actually, from which we actually want, want to understand how people mm-hmm. are dealing with that and why some people can do this very well and others can't, are not uh, present in these experiments. Yeah. And so I think that, that, that that's really critical. And another thing that I think is uh, related to that is that because we cannot really study temporal aspects of movement control uh, in these anticipation uh, tasks in video-based uh, paradigms, there has been a huge emphasis on only judgments and movements in the spatial domain. So going to the left or to mm-hmm. the right, and maybe even an overemphasis. Well, I'm not sure. So the reviewers still have to look into that, but... Uh, but we, we have now some data in, in soccer goalkeeping where we now think that so that there's this idea that expert goalkeepers actually look more to the uh, non-supporting leg mm-hmm. because the orientation of the uh, of the feet next to the ball is about 80% reliable uh, in terms of where the ball is going. We now think that they actually, they probably do use information from this feed, but it's not to know to dive to the left or the uh, right side, but when to dive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and you can only find this if you actually have goalkeepers that are diving and really try to intercept the ball. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great point. And yeah, it reminds you that there's a study I was talking to someone about recently. The, I think they looked in ten, actual tennis matches how much tennis players actually make like anticipatory steps to left or right yeah, yeah. before the... You, that would have to rely on before ball contact. And it's, it was very small percentage, like 10% or something. And most of the time it was when they were way behind in the 
game. So they were they were just taking a chance and guessing, probably. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we've yeah, I agree. We've overemphasized this. I think in in general in psychology, you've overemphasized the initiation of things, like right reaction times, yeah, 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 first steps. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way because of the way we study it, right? We we, yeah, yeah, we, we yeah. play waste. Yeah, so I, yeah. so, so I, I yeah. think we have to be really aware about. As students, we are raised in some kind of tradition mm. uh, with established paradigms. Mm -hmm. And these paradigms actually are really constraining what kind of topics we uh, we study. And I, so this is the study of Trio Lek you were talking about, where they were, I think. Mm -hmm, I think uh, so, yeah. Where, yeah, where they were looking at ATP tennis players. And I really like that study because it's, it's, it's simply just observing what is happening in real life and take mm. that as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should uh, make it mandatory for our students to do a first study looking into the real life. <laughs> yes. Uh, trying to do the laborers' work, just video recordings, and then, <laughs> uh, and then the counting work. Try to find patterns, describe the phenomenon, mm -hmm. and then start to think about how to explain the phenomenon. And we have created lots of phenomena in the lab. Mm -hmm that are interesting phenomena in the lab, but they are created to test theories and not to explain what happens in real life. And uh, of course, we also need, we, we also need uh, theories, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think at the end, they should also tell us something about uh, the phenomena in real life. And movement science, sport science, uh, is actually par excellence, I think, the, uh, the type of study where you can do this, yeah. um, which makes it also, also so exciting uh, because you can actually observe. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so if you're a psychologist and you want to know how people think, that's much more difficult to observe. Yeah. Then, uh, and so we should not use the paradigms of the psychologists because they have other other trouble, other problems than we have. So yeah. we have to go outside. <laughs> I like that. Yes, <laughs> that's a good. That's a very good point. We don't have to black box. We're trying to dig into. We can yeah, just yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. You can <laughs> see the action itself. The last thing, I, topic I wanted to ask you about, John, the, the work you've been doing is on creativity. Um, in, in movement and contrasting the traditional view of what creativity is versus kind of the way that you're thinking about it. I know this is work you did with um, <clears throat> Dominic Orth, right? You yeah, know. with Dominic yeah. Orth and yeah. uh, also uh, Rob Withagen mm -hmm. and, uh, and Daniel Mehmet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Daniel Mehmet is, I guess, the, the traditional uh, uh -huh. guy in the collab collaborators. And, and again, so uh, I, I think the, the, the first time I really started to talk about and probably also think about creativity was actually in exchanges with Daniel. Uh, and we started talking about, again, an, uh, a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. and so this was a model of uh, actually some Dutch researchers at the Order University in Amsterdam, and which I've never met these guys, <laughs> uh, from the Dreu and Nijstad. And they they introduced the dual pathway model for creativity. Okay. And and so um, what they try to do is arguing that you have two types of creativity. One is what in layman's term is often considered as creativity, thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. So they, they call this flexible creativity. And the eureka uh, moment uh, suddenly pops up, and we have the solution. And then there's another kind of creativity, which is the hard work. So it's persistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you work really hard, then uh, actually you can also get new ideas or new solutions. And so what, what they were doing in this model was based on, uh, was thinking about, again, what kind of processes are actually underpinning these different uh, types of creativity. And they were looking at, uh, again, working memory. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you uh, think of persistent creativity where you try to find work your way towards a solution, then you need some memory of what you've been done uh, been doing before. Mm -hmm. And so a strong memory, working memory then helps. Uh, you need focused attention rather than broad attention. So there were all kinds of distinction. And Daniel was actually working uh, from that. And uh, I think he was one of the first to ex uh, introduce this kind of thinking into sports science. Mm -hmm. what, what I find interesting here is that it's, uh, it's a basic cognitive model, uh, I think, where in, to some degree the idea is that we have all kinds of processes, thinking processes going on. Uh, before the act, we uh, indeed create ideas. And then if, if we have the idea then uh, the most important thing has been done because then we only have to execute it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, well, that, that's for you, moving scientists, to find out how to execute it. Yes. But, the, but, get, but getting the idea, <laughs> uh, then we have all the bright people to, to study this. And what you see is that, that people are uh, looking for brain networks that are actually creative networks that if they are active or in some, some sense working very well, then you're a creative person. So then, then you can say, well, we have uh, some people are creative, some are not. Uh, so th- I think this is some kind of constructionist approach where you develop based on internal processes. And th- of course, there's input from outside. But the main thing are the internal processes that create the idea. And if that, if that idea is new, uh, then we call this creative. And based on more ecological approaches, then we would argue that um, based on uh, information movement couplings and affordances, that while you move and doing things or making things, it's in that process that you create new information mm-hmm. or that you can discover new or create new affordances. To create new things or new actions, it's always in interaction with the environment, and perhaps and not all. It's always in interaction, so you always need the environment there. And often in the interaction that you discover these uh, things. And I, I think the Fosbury flop mm-hmm. is in a sense a very nice example there. You can actually see if you look into all the kinds of different techniques that have been used through history, that if there's an introduction of a new technique, then you get a small jump in uh, in, in world records, etc. So this guy Fosbury was actually a good uh, athlete, but not uh, not 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 the guy mm. to become the world champion and so he and I, i'm not sure anymore what the technique was what, that they were uh, that he was practicing mm-hmm. but uh, the, his coach allowed him to every now and then do his own thing and um, what's interesting that uh, he did this in time frame when they just had introduced these uh, crash mats these safety yeah. mats mm-hmm. so before that you were actually landing just on the on sand mm-hmm. and but if you do a fosbury flop <laughs> uh, then probably you do the do this only once. <laughs> yes, and uh, and now hopefully you survive, <laughs> and then you're just smart not to do it a second time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you need these mats uh, that allow you to do uh, to create different different things. Mm-hmm. And so if you read the Fosbury clearly discovered during practice while doing this while while tinkering in this environment that this would work out. And it's the so it it's important that it's that these constraints were there to allow to to have this kind of technique emerging. I think it's quite nice that also in Canada there was a, a female athlete. I think she was called Debbie Brill. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. Google on the internet, then mm-hmm. you can find uh, video clips of her who did at the same time also a Fosbury flop. So she uh, invented it separately from Fosbury. And which suggests that it's not a bright idea in this in this uh, Dick Fosbury, but mm. that the constraints were set for people to actually discover or create this new technique. Mm-hmm. And so, that, that, and I think that's an important thing. So, um, if you want to study uh, creativity or uh, creating new actions, I would say, then it's important that you actually uh, again go and watch how people move, how they practice. And how they, uh, if, if you manipulate constraints, how they respond to that and find new solu- uh, solutions that for them might be new. And every now and then, and maybe that's, and I'm not sure about that one, maybe that's simply a, a statistical mm-hmm. property that if those people that are highly variable and have a, uh, a degenerate uh, movement repertoire are more likely to also have a few solutions mm-hmm. that almost nobody else had. And then it's, then it's not so much because this is a very creative person, but this, uh, but it's because it's a, uh, someone that uh, he or she has a, f- a large movement repertoire to uh, solve a movement problem in a, in a certain situation or use lots of resources, environmental resources in that situation. Yeah. No, I think that that's a really good point. It kind of parallels the kind of decision-making ideas in in ecological psychology, right? We don't just sit in a chair, <laughs> come up with something, then go do it, right? The, the, it emerges from us interacting with the environment, and and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think there's all, you emphasize like the constraints, and then also the coaches. They had they were lucky to have coaches that were kind of encouraging, like you said, 
being variable instead of yeah, yeah, trying yeah. different instead of always do this perfect oh, yeah, technique yeah, yeah. i think i think yeah. it's re- that's 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 really important so uh, and and that's all, again it's, it's some kind of strawman but you do not want to have coaches that strive for ideal movement patterns and are very prescriptive put all all the athletes through the same same molds you want coaches that can actually challenge athletes to do new things and know where, where these challenges are and allow them to, to vary in how they solve problems and actually challenge them to vary in their practice rather than repeating and optim- only re- some, some repeating and optimizing is, is, is definitely good. But you also need to increase your variability and learn to deal with new situations. That's a work from uh, Duarte Araujo and, and, mm-hmm. and Keith Davis. They are talking about co-designing the learning landscape or the, 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 the affordance landscape mm-hmm. in terms of coach and athletes together creating new uh, affordances in the practice landscape. I think that's key. And, and so in that sense, I don't think that creativity is something magic or something special. It's actually, uh, if you talk about motor learning, then what we actually are talking about is, or what we want is that people, at least from what they can do right now, from from their starting point, create new actions. Mm-hmm. And and creativity is, I think, is not a, a noun a thing. It's an action. So it's a creating creating actions or creating things. And I think that's what we really need to be aware of. And that in itself, if it's a verb, then we also should. Uh, research people when they are acting because then they are creating and then we have to provide them with situations that also challenge them to create or design uh, new landscapes Mm -hmm. to be honest so if you want to have uh, grand monies and creativity Mm -hmm. this is a good job yeah but for me for me it's just it's just motor learning and 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 it's a and it's a step beyond only looking at automatization uh, creativity or adaptivity and I like creativity over adaptivity uh, mm-hmm. in terms of concepts are aspects of uh, of expertise and that's uh, also something and hence something that we need to understand also in motor learning how can we teach students or, or athletes not only to move very uh, efficiently but also very creatively because mm-hmm. certainly in sports this has, has a big advantage so that's an important topic for motor learning I would say. yeah yeah i really agree john i think that's a great way to think of it is if we believe in degeneracy and we kind of support it and as a coach and, <laughs> and push it like with constraints then it should creativity should happen all the time right you should yeah, 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 it's yeah. nothing really coming up with different ways to do things is is like so, a natural <laughs> for yeah, us yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, and i think yeah. we are we, we create new things almost daily uh, but we are uh, really focused on those uh, superstar examples of mm-hmm. creativity but mm-hmm. in terms of the process Mm-hmm. So they are more skilled. If these superstars create a new action, then it's more likely that it's a new action for all humanity because mm-hmm. of the level of skill they have. Uh, but in terms of the process, it's not different from uh, you and I doing uh, something new when we are first time <laughs> zooming or something like or shaking, uh, shaking <laughs> elbows. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and so so in, in, in terms of the process, it's so, not something new. And I think it's, and I, oh, but I'm not sure, not completely so i also think it's not necessarily the case that these spot players are just more creative they are more skilled and they have invested much more time and dedication to become skilled in a certain certain practice and that might be uh, sports and because they're on this level everybody can see everybody recognize that he's then doing something new and find this creative but it's i i don't think it's that that makes it special or that we then therefore have to search for something in these sports players that puts them apart from from less skilled players mm-hmm. in terms of creativity. They are different in terms of the level they have, but not in, I don't think they are necessarily, di- necessarily different in terms, of, in terms of creativity. And this level also comes typically due to the time investment with a huge degeneracy in terms of what they can do. Mm-hmm. That, that that's part of expertise I think. yeah yeah i think that all that all makes sense and yeah i think you, you might be able to think of it as you know more higher level pe- athletes are also better kind of stabilizing and optimizing when they find something new yeah, yeah, they yeah, can yeah, really yeah. perfect it 
because, yeah, because yeah. like you said, they pr- they have more time to practice it. They yeah. Have, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I also think yeah. that if they show this in in competition, then mm-hmm. it's 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 very likely that that was not uh, something that they invented on the spot there. It's no. very likely that they mm-hmm. actually in, discovered this or created this during practice. Mm-hmm. And then they, they and then at some point they can use it in a match. Mm-hmm. And then we see it for the first time, but it's likely that they already have put some effort in further developing and stabilizing what they are doing. So you have this discipline in gymnastics, mm-hmm. in, in male gymnastics, where you have this uh, rod where you're swinging on and turning yeah, around. Giant, and, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the, what's the, I, don't, I don't know if we call it the giant swing or something. I know what you yeah, mean, though. It's yeah, a, yeah, they yeah. do really big swings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have this guy in, in the Netherlands who, I think eight years ago, so won the gold medal on this uh, discipline mm-hmm. and uh, has been a uh, uh, world champion uh, once or twice. And at, at some point, he was actually also doing competing and then actually made an error. Mm-hmm. And uh, so missed missed the bar with one hand, and then turned around with the other hand. <laughs> and so uh, the, the the report and everybody knew uh, uh, how this uh, activity what he was doing would evolve. So everybody knew it was an error. Mm-hmm. But if he wouldn't have known, then perhaps we would have said, "Well, this is very uh, very creative action." And that, that, this is an example, I guess. That did happen on the spot, mm-hmm. and, and uh, he was so adaptive that he could actually deal with this perturbation and, and still continue. Mm-hmm. But typically, and, and I presume that these things will also happen during during practice or during training, and then you start perhaps developing this further, and then it can become part of what you do in the match. And then everybody says, "Yeah, <laughs> it's great that this is creative." Yeah, and it, it is. It is, of course. But yeah, it's, yeah, but, but it's not something special. Yeah, not the way we we tend to think of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the very last question I have for you, John, is what kind of you're working on now? What what, what you're uh, in the future once you're allowed out of the house? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. I have lots of things going, but mm-hmm. one one of the th- things that I that I hope I get going, and mm-hmm. I don't know if I manage, but that's about the development of uh, cycling. Okay. Uh, in in the Netherlands, everybody cycles, of course. Mm-hmm. And you can see this now all in uh, all over Europe. Uh, people are getting uh, afraid for public transport. So big cities like Brussels and Paris and Milan, they now uh, promote cycling. And Amsterdam wants to be the capital of cycling in the world. Mm-hmm. But still, if you look at, at young kids, then uh, about 15 to 20 percent of the kids can actually not cycle. And these are children from mainly uh uh, lower economical uh, uh, classes as well. And so we're now involved in, in projects uh, where we actually want to develop an educational program in primary school where, where kids not only learn to cycle, and so um, just the technique of cycling, and th- this is, I would almost say, diehard motor learning, which mm-hmm. in itself is, is really interesting uh, because we have the habit here to, if children of... Uh, three years, four years. If we learn them to cycle, then we provide them with cycles with supporting wheels. Mm -hmm. And then they can learn to pedal and uh, and steer a little bit and brake. But uh, what they do not learn is how to keep balance because they have the support uh, supporting uh, wheels. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on, uh, I think, the work from Bernstein and uh, based on human movement Mm -hmm. science, so there's no... Mm -hmm. uh, The the first thing you, if you learn a new action, what you need to do is be able to maintain your orientation relative to the environment. And so what we do here is actually take away the need to learn this. And then if we uh, switch these children to a regular bike, removing uh, the side wheels, then you see all these parents running behind the children, uh, <laughs> supporting them so that they don't fall. With mm-hmm. that, that yep. I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that as well. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and that's already going on for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have this German invention that we call a walking bike or a balance bike. Mm-hmm. There are no uh, supporting wheels. And the children can just walk and then just let the bike go and then steer. And so they learn to keep balance. And so one of my students have been uh, just asking many parents, a bit like uh, what, what uh, Anders Eriksson was doing with the uh, elite players, how much have you trained and mm-hmm. when did you start training, etc. And what we actually found is that children that practice on these uh, balance bikes 
can cycle independently uh, six months earlier than mm-hmm. children that use supporting wheels. And we have also a um, group of children that first use the balance bike, then supporting wheels, and then the regular bike. And they do as slow as children that never had a balance bike. So these sporting wheels are actually really delaying development, I would say, or learning mm-hmm. rather than, than helping learning. So some of these kids are 10 or 11 years old and then cannot do this. And so we, we were involved in some pilot studies where they were training these kids also in with, with balance bikes. Mm-hmm. And it, it's really nice. So you have these kids that all the friends can bike and they can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's really important in the, in, in the Netherlands, I guess. And it's mainly because it's not in the habit of their families or their parents have no time or they have no money for a bike. You practice with them on the schoolyard. And then s- some of them in five minutes, they can bike. Then you should see their the faces, how happy they are. So mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the value that this has, and of course, they can only bike on a, on a schoolyard. In, in some sense, it's actually, uh, you can uh, see that you can very quickly make a real difference for these kids. But the next step is, of course, that we also need to uh, teach them to, to be able to bike in traffic. And of course, then uh, w- what they are taught are traffic rules, etc., but they need they need to learn anticipation and and perception of when they can cross a street or not or not, and so I think these are really important topics, uh, valuable topics where we can actually use lots of the things and principles that we have been talking about uh, the last hour, mm-hmm. and 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 hopefully also go a bit quicker and uh, rather than put all these kids for a video screen looking at, at cars and saying, well, I can cross this one. No, I can't cross this one. And mm-hmm. so come up with some invention or some ideas of how to actually do this in a safe way in schoolyards or whatever places where mm-hmm. they can really negotiate all the traffic mm-hmm. uses and, and learn to anticipate. So this is a collaboration that we try to set up with Mathieu Lenoir in Gent and mm-hmm. Christoph Schnitzel in Strasbourg. So it's a European thing. And uh, hopefully we get some uh, some money to... Uh, do yeah. <laughs> Well, and uh, lots of other, uh, <laughs> this is one of the things that uh, where lots of these things are coming together, and and also I think have a have a nice impact on uh, can have a nice impact on people's life. I could totally see how that could change totally change a kid's life if you, yeah, that's really important. So this is great, John. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Well, yeah, I always <laughs> like to talk about my, uh, my, my, my hobbies, but today, so. Thanks again for the great discussion, John. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Don't away.